Neurons come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Um, the, um, I'm showing you here two examples. I mean, this here is a so-called Purkinje cell, right, which, is, uh, which lives in the cerebellum. People always show that because it's a particularly beautiful neuron. It really looks almost like a, um, like a coral. I don't know if any of you guys scuba dive or if you like, um, you know, sort of if you, you, you may have seen movies of underwater and you get these sort of, these corals that sort of extend out all these sort of branches with which they sort of feed from the current. And the thing is that actually the Purkinje cell, you can almost think of it like a, you know, what happens in the Purkinje cell is that these cells are arranged in the cerebellar cortex, okay, this little brown sort of substance here at the bottom. They're arranged really like this sort of like, um, one after the other in a stack, all right? And you get lots and lots and lots of axons, you know, sort of basically cables coming from other neurons that will run through this like this, okay? And you can almost imagine that they are basically, these are guys are filtering out the information that they want, okay? Um, and the, um, so these things that are growing out of here are called the dendrites of the neuron, okay? Dendrites from Greek dendron meaning tree, okay? They've got basically tree-like branches growing out of them. Very beautiful in the Purkinje cell. Perhaps less beautiful but still very well developed here in this cell which is a um, cell from, a so-called pyramidal cell from the cortex. Okay, it's the cerebral cortex. So here we got, you know, dendrites growing out. This is called pyramidal because it's got a little bit of a pyramid shape in its cell body. It's the most common cell type in the cerebral cortex. And so um, a typical neuron, in as far as there is such a thing, will have one little uh, um, body called its soma. The plural of soma is somata, okay. Um, it may have one or several dendrites growing out of it, and it will typically have one axon growing out of it, only one, all right? But this one axon that grows out of it can branch very heavily. Okay. And neurons, as we will see later, are really devices for collecting information and for uh, processing information. And they collect their, you know, certainly in the mammalian brain, they collect their information almost exclusively through their dendrites and a little bit through their soma. And they then output their information to the axon. Okay. So this is, an, you know, it, information goes in here and information comes out there. All right. So this is how they basically run through the neuron like this. So something has to happen. Okay. We basically collect information here, 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 and then we think about it and integrate it. And then we basically make a decision about that information and that we send our decision out to the axon. We'll look at that in more detail in the course of the next two lectures, how this particular process works. Okay, so that's um, how neurons work, okay? That's what neurons sort of are about. Now, um, what would you see if you were to sort of zoom in more? Okay, we're in the process of zooming in. We've looked at the brain from the outside. We've seen it if you were to just, um, sort of, you know, if you uh, were to just take a little cut here out of the cortex and you would zoom in, you'd see lots of neurons like this, you'd see that they have dendrites, you'd see that they have axons. Let's zoom in further and see what the actual, you know, what the actual neurons would look like. Well, under the microscope they'd look a bit like this, all right? These are sort of classic drawings by uh, a famous neuroanatomist called Ramani, Ramani Cajal, who sort of drew them in the 1900s, early 1900s. Um, and, um, well, they look like cells, okay? These are look like, like biological cells. They have little membranes around them. They have got a nucleus inside them, okay? Um, but, um, you know, what are they made of? And what sort of, what would, what would we see if we zoomed in even further? Well, ultimately, there comes a point where if we zoom in further, we'll see that this is all made out of molecules and atoms, all right? So just to remind you, because... Um, you know, you, you're, very, uh, you, you know you, you're not chemists and you haven't done much chemistry. And those of you who have done any chemistry maybe a little while ago. What are atoms? All right. So the thing about an atom is you've got basically atoms are made out of a positively charged um, nucleus. And then they've got um, a shell that's made out of ne negatively charged electrons. All right. It's really, usually you have a certain number of positive charges which come from so-called um, protons, okay, that sit in the nucleus. And the more positive charges you have in there, 
the more negative charges you're, you know, the more electrons you're allowed in your shell, effectively, because you can, you know, of course, the positive charges in the proton will attract the electrons. Okay, so the more positive charge you have in the center, the more negative charge you can attract from the outside. Now, there are, there are very complicated reasons to do with quantum physics, which I don't fully understand, and I certainly don't expect you to fully understand, why um, atoms actually l become particularly stable if they can have certain numbers of electrons in their shells. But sometimes, the, you know, these numbers aren't necessarily the same number as they have positive charges. All right, so if they have, say, if you're, a, you're an atom who's got um, uh, just one positive charge, it turns out actually you'd be stable if you had two electrons. Okay. So if we have a hydrogen atom which just got one positive charge, you know, uh, in the middle and one electron in your shell, then the most stable thing for you to do actually is to find another atom with which you can share electrons so that you can have a pair. All right. So if you then have two hydrogen atoms linked together like this, all right, then you end up with an H2, two hydrogen atoms making a an hydrogen molecule which is linked together by a so-called covalent bond. Okay? Covalent bond simply means that you've got atoms that are linked together into a molecule by sharing electrons. Okay. So we've got atoms making molecules and we've got molecules making everything else. All right. So if we were to zoom into this, all right, we'd see ultimately atoms and molecules, but there are certain um, atoms and molecules that we'd see a lot of, okay, and substances that are going to be of particular importance to us. They're going to be water, salt, fat, and protein. All right. These are the ingredients, okay, if we're going to cook a neuron, if we want to make, a, you know, make, a, make one at home, these are, you know, take firstly water, all right? Mostly, you know, about 60% or so is going to be water. Salt, much less, but it's going to play a hugely important role. Um, fat and protein are the other main ingredients. So what, what's important to know about these? Okay. Water, our main thing. Okay. So we've got our oxygen atom and we've got two hydrogen atoms. Okay. They will link together in covalent bonds just in order to be able to produce sort of an outer shell where the electrons can whiz about, all right, which is nice and stable. All right. Why this one happens to be a particularly nice and stable shell, you have to ask the quantum physicist if you know any. All right. um, so um, the, um, this is by far the most abundant molecule in your brain. Okay, and it plays an important role in, in there, as we'll see in a moment. The thing about the shell, the electron shell in, in water, is that it's not... Um, the electrons don't whiz about this water molecule in a way that they're everywhere the same amount of time, if it were. All right. So they'll actually spend more time around the big fat oxygen atom than they'll spend around the two hydrogen atoms. That means that the, you know, the electrons, which are themselves negatively charged, will be more here, so therefore it will be a little bit, this part will be a little bit more electrically negative than these two bits. All right. Why is that important? Well, negative charges are attracted, a bit like little magnets, to positive charges. Okay, this is the electrostatic force. All right. We'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. This electrostatic force, of course, means that if you've got an, a water molecule that's got a negative bit to it and a positive bit to it, all right, the positive bit of one water uh, molecule will be attracted to the negative bit of the other. All right. So, and like this, they can kind of, you know, you can imagine they kind of like to stick together. So that makes water molecules sticky relative to other water molecules. And that helps in, you know, this is one of the reasons why water likes to form drops, okay, it likes to stick together. Um, it also helps water dissolve salt, all right. Salt is another... Um, another really important ingre ingredient for brains. Okay? Brains cannot work without salt. It doesn't mean you should eat too much salt, but certainly if you didn't have enough salt in your diet, there would come a point where your brain would stop functioning. And your muscle cells would also stop functioning and all sorts of, you know, you really need it as a molecule, you know, you needed salts uh, uh, in order to generate the electricity that your body needs. All right. So how does that work? The thing is that um, you may have heard that um, table salt is sodium chloride, okay? So 
Um, that means you've got a, you've got sodium atoms and you've got chlorine atoms that make it up. Okay, but the thing is, okay, your sodium atom will normally have 11 protons, and you know will therefore be entitled for to 11 electrons in its shell, and the chlorine would have 17 protons and would be entitled to 17 electrons. But it turns out that actually these, rather than sharing electrons, the sodium atom is actually relatively happy to just give up one electron and just go around with 10 electrons in its shell meaning that it's actually it becomes an ion where it's, an, it's basically a free floating atom that um, has one positive charge All right. whereas the chlorine atom will quite happily steal this electron from uh, in the sodium atom, the chlorine atom, so that it becomes a chloride ion which has an extra electron and is therefore negatively charged. So if you then have um, so if you have salt and uh, you know if you have a salt crystal, you've got these chlorine ions, the chloride ions and the sodium ions, which are of course you know negatively and positively charged little particles, they'll be mutually attracted to each other and they'll pack themselves nice and densely together in this sort of nice crystal lettuce. Oh, okay, so you've got this little salt salt crystal. But what, as soon as you get water coming into contact with these crystals, what's going to happen is that, of course, the, these pol polar water molecules, you know, the, the um, positively charged um, hydrogen atoms are going to become attracted to the negatively charged chlorine. Okay. And that means that the water will basically start to, um, you know, to group itself around the chlorine ion. And that will allow the chlorine ion to basically then leave this crystal lettuce and float off. All right. Similarly, the water, just by turning the other way around, you know, just by showing the, the positively charged sodium ion, their negatively charged um, oxygen bottoms, if it were, all right, they, all group, they can all group around the sodium ion and make the sodium float away. So you end up with chlorine ions and sodium ions being able to just float off all right, and disperse like this. This, okay, so these are then free, freely floating ions, um, which are, have, which have uh, water molecules that are electrically attracted to them, densely packed around them. All right. So this is known as a hydration shell. All right. Basically, you just, if you're an ion and you're in water, all the water molecules, because they themselves are polar, will become attracted to you and will flock around you. All right. And they can just, um, you know, and then the, you know, like this, the salts quite happily dissolve in water. Now the thing is that as soon as you have charges, electrically charged particles being able to flow about and move about, you have what people call electrical currents. If you have a, you know, if you switch on the electric light and there's a current flowing through your switch, that current will be um, normally be carried by electrons that in the metal can whiz from one electron shell to another. All right. Uh, so all the electrical items that we use in our, you know, domestic lives or you know, in modern modern world will usually the currents will be carried by electrons. In your body, in your brains, in your muscle cells, in your heart cell, there are lots of electrical currents going on. They are all carried by ions that are in solution. Okay. The fact that the fluids in your cells uh, and between the cells in your body have salts dissolved in them makes the water uh, a conductor of electricity. 